This meeting is being recorded. Well, Tanya, how are you doing? <laughs> doing very well. How about you? All right. This is uh, um, Rick Moore for White Cap Publications, and I'm interviewing author Tanya Torres to announce her new book, Heart of the Machine, which is a fantastic read, and I recommend everyone get it. I really, I, it really is a spectacular read, right? So congratulations. Thank now, you so much. Yeah, good. How did you come up with this plot? I, it's truly amazing in a particularly fascinating setting. Is there truly a Mount Ontaki in Japan? So I was, I wrote it during my second part of quarantine and I was listening to a lot of Grimes's music. I was, it was like 100 most beautiful places in Japan. And it brought out Mount Ontaki, which is the second highest volcano in Japan. Right. It really stuck with me. And I was like, that should be in something. I don't know. And I kind of just held on to it for a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you ever see Mount Ontaki in videos or on the Internet? Yeah, I just I saw like so, you know, everyone always talks about Mount Fuji, but that was the first time anyone brought up that one. And it was after I read the article. I just looked at, you know, some National Geographic kind of like videos and pictures of it and I was like there's just something really alluring about it and you just you know that I never heard about it before it just stuck <laughs> with me all right now what is the origin of your aliens the man of Tadia? and is it never revealed what made you think of them as having no true origin and could you tell us a little bit about the man of Tadia? so I thought of them as almost kind of like that they would have no mother planet that they would be kind of like almost like scattered scavengers or just endless travelers that it was kind of like that they did a lot of their breeding on the ship that they would maybe like combine like if they ran into other mantidea in space that they would combine forces but that there's no like mother planet so that they travel endlessly they like probably just what they did to earth that they do to other planets kind of like scavengers like they just kind of take whatever is theirs oh wow they travel from planet to planet then right that's kind of how i saw them i mean i never really it's never really truly revealed but I always thought that aliens, like, well, if they're so smart, why would they stay in one place? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. Now, what do the Manitidea look like? They're like praying mantises. I was really, um, I was really inspired by Ender's Game and how they made the aliens not human-esque, but almost like insects, but Ooh. insects that were really smart and had high tech. I just thought that was such a cool idea. So I thought of them as like a praying mantis. <laughs> oh my God, that is a cool idea, actually. Yeah, I mean, huh. Now, are they a hive mentality? I thought of them as having like the hive mind and that was their advantage against humanity because as Bellamy, the main character is kind of describing how humans have lost earth to them. It's because people cannot work together no matter how much we try to communicate, no matter how much we try to have the same goal in mind that people just ultimately are messy and cannot work together sometimes but the aliens have like are like a perfect machine. They're a perfect colony that they listen to their orders, that there is no dispute, that they just do what they're told. And I thought that that would be kind of scary in its own way. <laughs> well, they're kind of top-down management? Yeah, I thought of them as like kind of like, like almost like bees, like there would be like the queen that has all the babies, gives the orders, there's the drones. And then there, of course, there'd be like, just like the rogue ones that kind of just go out and hunt on their own. But for the most part, that they would be following the command of of the higher up. Right, right, right. All right, the line, um, she is humanity's savior, is a truly exceptional line. You describe uh, honor enhancements in this manner, uh, Gwen's enhancement, rather. His, Bellamy's father, is Bellamy is the main character, approach differed from any others. He took a human fetus and implanted it with a device. It looks like a metal flower on the side of her head. This enhances her intelligence. It gives her mental speed and calculation of a supercomputer. The device augments what is already there. Humans are smart, but the device is welcome welcome advantage against the Manitidea. Now, what on earth made you think of that? <laughs> so, I um, mean, honestly, it, the device on her head or device in her or what? I thought of it so um, I'm not like the, I'm just not the smartest when it comes to science or tech. So, I would watch other people in the field like I watched a lot of Elon Musk right. podcasts to kind of get an idea of what he saw for the future of humanity and when he talked about Neuralink just like this thing you would put in your head and it would hook you up to the internet and you'd be able to like essentially communicate with other people I kind of thought of it as like a very advanced version of Neuralink that you would put it in 
and it would just augment your intelligence. That it would almost be like like it's hooked up to a database that feeds you all the information that you could ever want. Wow, that's really cool, actually. Now, how does the her physiology impact that? I mean, what was she like? She had the device on her head. Did it um, sort of communicate for the rest of her body? And yeah. So I imagine everybody? the advice, like the the device, would be implanted, and that it would change her from the inside. Like it describes that it fortifies her bones, that it fortifies her organs, that it releases sort of like these tendrils of metal to enhance certain parts of her. Right, right. Huh, now that's kind of odd actually. Um, can she communicate with other people? Like in other words, is the um, combined intelligence of other people accessible by Gwen or does she have to have her information fed to her? I think she has, it's like she has the the database, like a library, a very like dry academic, nonfiction, scientific right. papers. But when it comes to dealing with people, she's like very, um, she has like very limited emotional capabilities because you can't really teach someone that through a device, through paper. It's something that you have to experience. And so in the final, when they wake her up, Bellamy's kind of ideas that he's like, I'm supposed to teach her to how to be human and that's what's gonna make her want to save us. In other words, he has to teach her emotion, emotional link mm -hmm. to people, right? Huh, all right. Now the first awakening of Gwen is truly awe-inspiring. Do you have a scientific background or was that just crafted by your imagination? Tell the viewing audience what enhancement she has and how they came about. So I have no really, I'm not really good at math or science. I've always been more like a, like a writer artist person, but I, I really love science fiction novels and movies. One of my favorite movies was Splice with Adrian Brody and they're splicing together these creatures that are supposed to have like good cells and stuff in them. And I really like the idea of in that movie, they were thinking that they were going to create a God. And that's kind of what Bellamy's father thinks that he's going to create. And I like the kind of like the scary factor of creating something that you can't control, something that's like supposed to be for the betterment of humanity, but you're not quite there in how you're going to execute it yet. You know, I've never seen the movie Splice with Brady and Brody. I haven't seen it yet. It's <laughs> very cool. Because it's very created, creepy. <laughs> yeah, the way you created uh, the man of Zadia was kind of based on that, right? Yeah, just like the splicing together of different organisms and like what it would what it would create, what it would enhance. Actually, I meant you created Gwen based on that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, two years later, um, let's see. First, describe if you would the aliens' first appearance and Bellamy's father's reaction to them. His father's reaction to the eventual death of Nix was what? So when he, his father, Adam Krim, is creating the Ex Machina, he's creating it because he thinks that there may be catastrophic war, but didn't really anticipate an alien invasion. So he feels almost kind of down on himself that somehow he could not, like as a man that could anticipate anything, could not <laughs> anticipate this. And so, um, and he also isn't very good with his emotions himself. He's like kind of cold, um, scientific based man. And so when the project Nix falls through, he falls into a great depression and feels like everything is lost. And then when he gets a new donor to create another ex machina, he becomes almost overly attached, like treating her almost like a baby rather than a project. <laughs> now that is cool. That is cool. But um, so the first Adam Krim created the first Nix as a bulwark against war, right? Among humans, right? And then he was surprised by the alien invasion. Then he was surprised and then not knowing, also not knowing what the project was gonna be like, he didn't interact with her emotionally. He didn't really like sustain a relationship with her. Um, so she killed, the first project kills herself within like 10 days because without any interaction, without any anything to really live for other than like information, I just felt like that would be, I think it would just be miserable. <laughs> now, how did her father react to her death? The Nix's death? I think that it kind of describes that he, he kind of disappears, that he just like falls into a depression. He doesn't really talk to anyone. It's almost like he's like a shell of a person for a couple of years until he kind of like gets the wherewithal to try again. He never did really fully learn to communicate with other people, did he? 
No, and it's it's kind of sad because the story is told from Bellamy's point of view, and he's describing how sad his father is that Nick's killed herself, that the project didn't work. But he's neglecting his family. Like the whole Earth has been invaded by aliens. They're in this lab together. And instead of like having like, you know, reaching out to his wife or his child, right. he just secludes himself even further. Like they're already secluded in a mountain and then he he like tucks himself away even further. Well, I never thought of that. He was secluded in a mountain and he tucked in further, right? Mm-hmm. That's very instructive, right? I mean, honestly. All right. You don't go through at the beginning Gwen's developmental years, right? Instead, you start her at uh, birth as a fully formed woman. And what led you to make that decision? That's, you know, kind of curious because normally you create something and it wouldn't be isolated in a tank till full, full birth. So, but she came fully formed as a woman. How did that affect her? And um, really what led you to that decision as a writer? So I thought about isolation a lot. And um, so it's, she's grown in a tube. They get like a, a donor baby. She's grown in this tube the whole 20 years. Yeah, and it I describes really the, the, <laughs> the liquid in it is like also supposed to help fortify like her skin so that she can go into deep space. Right. That there is supposed to be a purpose in the isolation, but it's like from a human standpoint, when you're reading it, you're like, this is so sad and lonely. Like, I can't believe we would do this yeah, yeah, to a human being. Too. Right. But the thing is, we do things like that. We kind of test on things, you know, maybe not people yet, but we test on animals almost in this isolating, creepy way all the time. So I wanted the story to also be, so I always try to write a scary story that turns into a romance. Right. And I thought it'd be interesting that Bellamy's like 34 at this time, she's 20, and we don't really know who either of them are. I thought it'd be kind of fun to tell the story, like this is her awakening. Bellamy's kind of telling you how he ended up in this mountain with the, this alien invasion. And the story goes backwards, like, you know, you learn about his mom getting sick and you learn about how aliens invaded when he was playing baseball when he's 12. And you don't really know who he is. So it's like, like she's scary in her own way, but it's like, he's almost frightening because you're like, is this a good guy? Is this a bad guy? Right. You don't you really learn, know. You learn a lot about Bellamy by that technique of going backwards in time, don't you? Yeah. You really do learn a lot of them. At the same time, Mink, um, Gwen is forming her own peculiarities and her own um, awareness of herself, right? So if they don't have any blueprint for Nix, for example, killed herself after 10, um, 10 days. So they don't have any really blueprint blueprint to build on, do they? No, they, all they know is like Bellamy has told them like, let her do what she wants, let her walk around, try to be nice to her because he knows that the other project was just completely isolated and didn't interact with anyone, wasn't given any really free will. And he know it, he knows it ended up badly. So he's trying to do, he's kind of trying to do that. I'm not like my father. I'm going to be better than my father, but he doesn't really know what he's doing either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I, I took away from that, but I, it's really odd, but yeah. So what led you as a writer to make that decision though, to do it like that? It's a very clever uh, line of attack. The backward development, uh, backward um, information gathering about Bellamy. But as a writer, what led you to that decision? So I've always loved stories with like the unreliable narrators. So you'll start the story and you're like, I think that the person is good or I think the person is bad. And as the story goes on, you start to realize once your perception has changed, all these little things have also changed. And right. I always kind of hate stories that like, so I love science fiction books. I feel like there can be a lot of info dumping in them where it just, you know, just like paragraph after paragraph of this info dump. And I thought it would be more fun and like psychological right. for you to go through the story of like, you don't really know who these people are. You don't really know who's the good guy, who's a bad guy. And you don't really know what's going to happen because the main character doesn't know what's going to happen. Oh, that's, that's abundantly clear actually from your success for the book, because the book is great, right? The book is uh, wonderful the way you unfold the things. So let's see, um, was information fed to Gwen while she was developing? Or what do you mean that the device has grown with her all her life? Is that head device implant? All right. I, I kind of thought of like the implant would be like, so when she is an infant, you know, your brain is only so big. I kind of thought of it, it was like, it would be hooked up almost to like the internet and they would feed certain amounts of information at certain times because they're like, you know, just like a person can only handle so much 
even just because she's robotically enhanced, I think that they try to go through and like give her this amount of information at this time, give her this amount at this time. So it's like kind of trickled right. in like titration so that it's not too much. Right, right. How did they make that distinction? What's too much? What's a little? I'm fascinated by the idea, but I'm kind of curious what you think, right? I think in a way that she was she was given so much information and part of like maybe why she has such a flat affect when she comes out is that oh. there is no room for emotion. There's nothing else there other than what's right, been fed right. to her systematically. Well, that's a great idea. That's really a great idea. Now, you made this curiously insightful comment, which uh, she might be partially robotic, but underneath the exoskeleton metallic thread, she has a human heart. So how does she show that? I'm curious. So kind of like in the, I guess the things that she chooses for herself, like there's a scene where her hair has never been cut. So it's very long, like it's down to her knees. And Bellamy assumes that it's in the way. And he's like, I can have someone cut that for you. And she becomes very defensive, very angry. And she's like, don't touch it. And he's like, I'm not going to touch it, but can you tell me why? And she's like, well, I just like it because it's mine. And then she also chooses like romance novels and children's literature over nonfiction books. And then she really likes to play with the little boy that lives in the lab with them, Hakari. She genuinely has a relationship with him that isn't like forced, like kind of like the the idea that she's supposed to be humanity's savior. It's like, this is my duty, I'm supposed to do this. But I like the idea that she liked playing with the little boy just because she liked playing with the little boy. Maybe because she was kind of infantile herself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess so, right? She's kind of infantile herself and learning and growing at the same time She's at the same level as that little boy for development. Like emotionally, I would say, yeah, that she'd be like, you know, like a seven year old, but she's very, very smart, but she still is kind of exploring emotion, exploring right. what makes right. her mad, what makes her happy. Right. She's emotionally stunted when she first comes out. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Right. Or you also made this rather frightful description of Gwen, right? Gwen looks like a little goddess as she wanders the halls. Her hair sways above the back of her knees. She appears completely human until she turns her head and the floral device is visible again. The wires peek out from her dress and hover above the ground. They're rattle like snakes waiting, anticipating. Now that was very uh, graphic actually, but that seems an ominous portent of things to come of Gwen's dual nature and her internal struggle wherein she eventually kills another woman. How do you develop those two twin tracks for that emotional development, right? And that calculating mind. How do you develop those two independently instead of crossing the lines? I thought that Gwen's character would really compartmentalize a lot of things. And while she is not, she she probably doesn't really think of it like she's frightening people on purpose, but the anticipation of like the snake rattling and just knowing that she's smarter than everyone really puts people on edge. I wanted there to be like this tension around Gwen at all times mm-hmm. that even though she's not doing anything wrong, there is something very ominous and like scary about her. Yeah, that seems to be the case because when I read the book, um, like everything that Gwen did initially was always twinged with, um, why, how do I say this? It was always tinged with that uh, undercurrent of violence implied, but not violence realized. And the only time in the book that you got the violence realized was when she kills that woman. But the rest of the time, it's always violence implied, but not realized, right? Yes, I wanted it to be very tense. (laughs) Yeah, it was very tense throughout the whole book. It was really quite remarkable that you did it right that way. Hey, listen, uh, Tonya, would you be willing to inter- interview me next week? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, me interview you. But honestly, uh, it's a great book. I mean, I can't say enough about it. It's romantic. It's um, science fiction. And it's kind of a toss up um, following the link of the science and the romance, you know, but the romance wins in the end. Right. It's really cool. Really cool the way you did it. I like it a lot. Oh, well, thank you. Everybody go Another- buy that book, right? It's really good. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all sorts of places you can get it. But it's called Heart of the Machine, and it's really good. 
So all and right. a little bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, like every, it is a little like bit I, scary. I mean, like everything that I write, it has to be a little bit scary. I don't know. There's something about dark fiction that I just I really love it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Donya. So I'll see you next week. All right. Sounds good. All right. Same time, same place for another interview, right? All right. All bye right. Bye.